So I want to start by winding back the clock. Picture this scene. It's Christmas 2018 up north in the Orr family household. And this year, little do my family know it yet, but we're about to experience the best Christmas yet. For this year, it's not just myself, my brother, my sister, my parents and I. Oh no, this year, from when I got home on the 23rd of December, right the way through and into the new year, we had anywhere from 12 to 20-something people huddled up, crammed into our kitchen for dinner. And on one occasion, there was even a buffet spread for over 40 people. We're talking neighbors and family friends, cousins from afar. The Aussie cousins came all the way from Melbourne. The southern cousins came all the way from deepest, darkest Portsmouth. Step cousins, half cousins, granny and granddads, aunts and uncles, the whole gang gathered together and it was absolute carnage. <laughs> Beautiful chaos, but incredible celebrations. Now you can tell my dad's son, not just from our horrendous receding hairlines, but from our love of hosting people. So we loved that Christmas for so many reasons, but especially for the fact that we were gathering people, we were hosting people, and we enjoyed the fun, the excitement of a full and busy household. Now there's loads of ways in which you can tell my mum's son, not least the fact she gave birth to me, I would know I was there. But one thing we don't share in common is the stress of a full and busy household. You can imagine the preparations, the cleaning, the planning, and even more cleaning required to pull off such an event. Quite frankly, exhausting work. And on top of that, when the house is so busy, when it's so around with people, there is absolutely nowhere you can hide. You actually have to speak to people. An extrovert's dream, but an introvert's nightmare. And there's a short story that I want to read to you this morning where we see a house rammed and people crammed around the dinner table once again, this time not for Christmas, but for Christ himself. So we pick up the story at the end of Luke chapter 10, and I've stolen this quote from my friend Josh, who leads all things youth at 24-7 prayer. I'm pretty sure he stole it from someone else. But he said, when it comes to reading scripture, context is key. For when we take the text out of context, all we're left with is a con. So throughout this chapter of Luke's gospel, we've already seen Jesus send out the 72 to go ahead of him with the famous words, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out his workers into his harvest field. And that teaches us that we all have a part to play. So we need to get stuck in. Jesus was then challenged by an expert of the law who says, how do we inherit eternal life? Jesus simply says, love God and love others. And goes on to share the even more famous story of the good Samaritan. And Paul talked last week about prioritizing our love for God and our love for others. So keep that in the back of your minds because we're going to come back to that a little bit later. But it's just after that that we join the action. So if you've got your Bibles with you, why don't you grab them out? If you've got your phone, get that out as well. It should be up on the screen. It's already up on the screen. Brilliant as well. So it's Luke 10, 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that I'm doing all this work and my sister has left me to do it by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Seemingly pretty brutal words from Jesus. After all, here he is, having rocked up in Martha's home with his 12 disciples, 
at least 12, most likely even more, made himself comfortable, sat himself in the middle of the room, all attention is on him as he tells some stories, whilst Martha is running around trying to organize everything, prepare things, stressing about how on earth am I going to cater and cook and provide for all these people at such short notice. All the while Mary is sat, chilling at the feet of Jesus, when she's probably been given a list of all the things she's got to do, yet Jesus says, Mary has chosen what's better. Outrageous. And Luke just ends the story there. The chapter just stops and he moves on to a different story in the next chapter. So what on earth is going on? Well, I think it begins to make a lot more sense when we look at the individual perspectives and priorities going on in this short story. So let's start with Martha. As we've acknowledged, she's kindly opened up her home, she's welcomed them in, and she's clearly very concerned about being a good host. She clearly cares, she wants to make them welcome, and she's probably doing a pretty good job of it. She's got plenty to do and she's cracking on with it. And fair play, that's really difficult when you feel like you're doing it on your own. She's prioritizing hospitality, and that in itself is a great thing. In fact, it's something we are all called to do as Christians. We're called to invite in our friends and equally those on the edge of our social circles to involve them in every aspect of our life, in our work, our school, our education, our uni, whatever it may be, we are called to be hospitable people. But our motivation for doing so should never come from a place of stress, fear, or worry. And equally, it should never lead to stress, fear, or worry, but rather we need to extend this hospitality out of love for our neighbor, which we all know isn't always easy to do. But 1 John 4.19 teaches us that we love because he first loved us. Because when we truly receive his love, we can't help but love others. So that's Martha's perspective. She's hosting well, but she feels like she's the only one making an effort. And understandably, that's a pretty frustrating place to be. So now let's look at Sister Mary's. Mary, just like myself back in Christmas 2018, was paying attention to her guests in a rather different way. Arguably, a rather unhelpful way in Martha or my mom's mind. We read in verse 39 from our passage that Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he said. Now this is remarkable for many reasons, not least the fact that Jesus is a Jewish rabbi living in a culture and a context that didn't honor and treat women how they ought to be. The fact that he would not only let her be in the room, but let her sit at his feet and then he would teach her, that in itself is revolutionary. But what I find even more remarkable is that Mary just gets it. Something I wish I understood and remembered far more often. She sat at the feet of Jesus and she listened to him. How I wish I spent more time listening to him, becoming more like him, getting to know him, being still in his presence. You see, we're told where Martha was distracted, Mary was focused. Where Martha was worried and upset, Mary was sitting peacefully at the feet of Jesus, the Prince of Peace himself. When Martha was running around getting a little bit chaotic, Mary was enjoying the presence of God. But you see, Martha wasn't wasting her time, as we often hear in these kind of talks. As verse 40 tells us that preparations needed to be made, she just missed out on a better opportunity that Mary had grabbed hold of. And how often do we find ourselves in the busyness of life itself, getting caught up in it all? How often do we feel worried and stressed and upset as things begin to feel as though they're slipping out of our control? And how often do we come to the end of the day feeling like, maybe I've been a good witness today. Maybe I've served the Lord. Maybe I've been a good Christian. And then realize we've spent no personal time with Jesus whatsoever. 
I'd be the first to say it happens more times than I'd care to admit. And part of that is entirely on me. After all, I'm human and a little bit lazy at times. But also the last thing the enemy wants is for you to be spending quality time with Jesus. For you to regularly be spending time with him in the corporate and especially in the secret place. He wants to keep you lukewarm. Comfortable, but not dangerous. Believing it, but not living it out. You see, the other week, Jay, Jazz, and I, we headed off to go and serve as part of the movement team at Spring Harvest, running the worship in a youth venue. And it was an incredible time getting together every day with 300 young people coming together to spend time in his presence, worshiping him, praising him, and hearing from his word, praying and partying as the kingdom broke out and the spirit moved powerfully. And on one of the evenings, um, we opened up the floor to testimonies from the young people. And as they came up on stage, more and more of the Spirit was poured out as we heard stories of friendships being formed, people being healed from emotional and physical things that were going on, young people finding purpose in their lives and realizing who it is that God has made them to be. And over the course of the whole week, we had 27 young people give their lives to Jesus for the first time. Come on. And one of my favorite stories was from a 15-year-old lad who was struggling in life to the point that he'd started to self-harm, cutting his left forearm. And when he came up, he was hyperventilating, he was shaking, he was so filled with something, excitement, shock, elation, until all he could do was lift up his arm and show us how good God was. Because there were no more cuts, bruises, or scars, for he had been completely healed in the power of the Spirit as we worshipped him and people prayed for him. And that's unreal. That's how good our God is. And I share that not to show off what happened through our ministry, but rather to celebrate what God was doing through his. I left Spring Harvest with a full heart, on fire to go out and share the good news of Jesus. And it didn't take long as Jazz and I went to a friend's for dinner that night. The very night we left and we had this incredible conversation about Jesus with this family that couldn't care less. And these incredible conversations sow seeds. We know God's the one that's watered to them, but we're called to do it. And we got the opportunity to share who Jesus really is. Fast forward to this week, and I've been feeling a little bit tired, a little bit unmotivated, distracted, you could say. And I realized I've not really been spending any quality time with Jesus. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. When he sees that you're on fire, he's going to want to cool you down. And we need to be aware that the enemy wants us lukewarm and he wants us distracted. So let's not let that happen. Bringing it back, at this point, you may have a few important questions about what's going on in this story. Firstly, what's Jesus' perspective in this all? What's the big man saying? Second, what can we actually learn from this story of Mary and Martha that we can put practically in place in our own lives? And finally, what does this little story add to the wider narrative of God at work in the lives of his people? I'm going to try to take them in that order. So when Martha confronts Jesus, saying, look at all I'm doing whilst Mary's doing absolutely nothing, come on, tell her to help me out, let's remind ourselves of Jesus' response. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but a few things are needed, indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, if we break that response down, we see that Jesus doesn't boot off at Martha. He's not annoyed at her or upset with her. He doesn't have a go at her, but instead, he hears her plea, he understands and responds with compassion, acknowledging how she feels, yet gently pointing her towards what's important, realigning her heart and her priorities towards himself, and reminding her that she doesn't need to worry. He doesn't say Martha is wasting her time either, and he doesn't tell her she's doing a bad job. He just points to the reality that time spent with him is always going to be better. 
We read in Psalm 84, 10, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And this leads to the practical application for our lives. For it's quality time spent with him that needs to become the foundation of everything that we do. For when we make space and time in our day to spend time with him, we tend to slow down, we tend not to worry, and we tend to walk in step with what God is doing in and through our lives. God opens our eyes to see the world and everyone that we meet within it through his perspective. And that changes everything. Last week, Paul updated us on the incredible work of Matt 22 and the plans going forward, the exciting news of a new food bank location, plans to open up a cafe, and longer, wider ambitions to serve and love our community here in Odd Down. And through Matt 22, through us serving and loving our neighbors, I truly believe we're going to see the kingdom come here in Odd Down, here in Bath, as it is in heaven. We'll see dignity restored and lives transformed. And we'll see countless stories of people coming to faith after great conversations about Jesus. As they encounter him through his hands and his feet. Through us, the church. As we love God and we love our neighbors. But we can't do any of that without loving him first. Or it's simply a waste of time and effort. And Paul touched briefly on this last week, but I'd love to read it again. Jay mentioned it this morning as well. This time, real quick, from John's account. It's John 12, 1 to 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given to Jesus in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took out a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. A pretty familiar sounding scene. In fact, it's not only a different account of Matthew's version that Paul touched upon last week. But it's the same story, just a different account of the very first reading we had today. And I just want to briefly highlight two really simple things that we see going on. Firstly, what Jay touched upon, the sheer extent that Mary went to worship Jesus. She wasn't distracted. She did a beautiful thing. But it cost her. We're told the perfume was worth a year's wages. That's radical worship. Yes, the money could have been used to help the poor, as Judas rightly points out, but with the wrong motives. But instead, Mary loved God first. She knew the greatest commandment, but it cost her. And loving God and loving our neighbors is going to cost us as well. Secondly, really quickly, did you notice what's going on in the background of this story? Jay did a nice little tease to it earlier, which um, definitely the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Um, But whose house were they at? Martha, Mary, and their brother Lazarus, who Jesus has just raised from the dead. And at the very end of that short little story, we hear people are not only trying to kill Jesus for his incredible kingdom teachings and revolutionary ways, but Lazarus as well. All because his life 
was pointing towards Jesus. So when we live our lives, loving God first and then loving others, when we get out into the world to see the next level of Matt 22 happen, don't be surprised if people don't get it. Don't be surprised if people hate you for it or end up being against us for it. For it's not going to be easy. As if it were, that be the con when we take the text out of context. But it will be worth it. But how do we do this practically? How do we prepare for the next stage of Matt 22? And how do we live this out in our lives, especially when life already feels super busy? Now, this really is just scratching the surface, and I'm sure you've all got some great ways to put in place already, but here are a few real simple suggestions that will hopefully lead to deeper and stronger rhythms. Maybe just pick one, maybe two of them to try out this week, as I promise it won't be a waste of your time. So why not simply start your day by going, hey God, thank you that you are here with me. I invite you to work in my life today. Why not then pray as you commute, on the bus, in the car, or as you walk? Why not set up a verse of the day notification on your phone to ping up exactly during your lunch break? Or get yourself a nice little pocket Bible that you can just take around everywhere with you? Why not set up a Bible reading plan that you, with people that you can be accountable to? Or join one of the home groups, small groups that are happening so that you can journey together? Why not download or get hold of a new worship playlist to make praise and worship the soundtrack to your day? And my personal favorite, why don't you, at the end of the day, make a list of all the things you're thankful to God for, and then just spend time saying thank you to him, spending time doing that with him. I've been doing that every night this year, 2022, and it is honestly an absolute game changer. And finally, as we get towards the end, I just want to remind us that this story of Mary and Martha is part of a wider narrative. In verse 38 of our passage, we learn that it's whilst Jesus and his disciples were on their way that they ended up at Martha's. On their way where and what to do? To share the good news of the gospel that the Son of God had come to be with his people, to heal the sick and forgive the sinner, to look after the last, the lost, the least, and the broken, to tell people to repent of their worldly ways, which simply means to turn back to the God who loves them and wants to be with them. And this was a controversial road that led Jesus to the cross, that he would die in our place, that he would bear the penalty for our wrongdoings, our mistakes, our selfishness, our greed, for the way we treat and hurt others for our sins, so that we could be made right with God, loved and forgiven. But as we know, death would not have the final say in this story, for Christ was resurrected, defeating death, and making a way for us to have a relationship with God, our Father in heaven, that one day we too may be resurrected, to spend eternity with the God who has relentlessly been pursuing his people since the world began. That's the narrative of the cross, and that's our story. And when Jesus returned to heaven, he promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, and a gift that is still available and being received to this day, over 2,000 years later, by people all over the world, and a gift that is available to us this morning. So are we willing to lay down the distractions in our lives, to make space and time to be like Mary and enjoy his presence, knowing that it's in his presence that we come alive and we realize who we're truly made to be. Are we prepared to pay the cost, to worship him and love him and go out and encounter um, our neighbors, to love them so that they too may encounter him? For an encounter with Jesus changes absolutely everything. It fires us up and it sends us out. And I believe by his spirit, he wants to meet with us here and now. So what I'm going to invite us all to do, if you're willing and able, why don't you stand with me? We're going to make space to encounter the God alive and at work in our lives today. 
And I'm going to just pray one of my favorite prayers. It's real simple. And I just invite you to join me. And maybe if you feel comfortable, why don't you let, reach your hands out just like this. Just as a child receives a gift from their parents, we want to receive from our Father in heaven this morning. And we're going to wait and see what God wants to say to us. We're going to spend time in his presence, knowing that it's going to make us more like him. Knowing that we'll get to know him more. Knowing that it will fire us up and get us ready to send us out. So right now, Lord, we pray. Holy Spirit, come.